Welcome, everybody. Senate Education, Thursday, June 4th, remote hearing, um, still in the COVID emergency. So uh, we're continuing testimony today on child care generally. Last time we picked up the situation at UVM and St. Mike's and had just a bit of testimony. We're fortunate enough today to have the dean of the, of the college involved and also the director of the UVM Child Care Center. And I wanted to open with them. And I will say in full disclosure, my child went to UVM uh, daycare and it was a transformative experience for her and for my family. We, we thought it was absolutely the best care provided um, and we were always grateful for it. I participated in the anniversary celebration not too long ago for UVM childcare. So I was especially devastated to read that it was closing. So I, I will let you, you decide, Dean Thomas and uh, Barbara Burrington, what order you'd like to speak in. But if you could generally walk us through the decision-making around it, and in particular, I noticed in President Garamella's note to the community today, he wrote, among other things, he used the phrase regulatory impacts as a reason for closure. And that caught my eye and I wondered, are there regulations that have been propagated by the legislature that need changing in order to make the situation more tenable for daycare centers in the state? So um, feel free to introduce or jump into that anywhere you like whichever of you you'd like to start with. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Bruth, and uh, thank you to members of the committee for, for having us. Um, I think I will uh, give a general walkthrough um, how we got to where we are. Uh, Barbara, the director of the Campus Children's School, is uh, versed in all matters operational and uh, a lot of the policy nuance that you may be interested in as well. But let me start with... Uh, how we got to where we are. And Senator Bruth, I'm, I, I'm appreciative of your, your participation in our 50th anniversary, and it it's makes this moment uh, particularly poignant uh, for us. And um, I have to say that uh, this is one of the, by far, hardest decisions that I've had to make as a, an academic or an administrator in my entire career. And, um, the Campus Children's School, as you know, is a beloved institution that has made many contributions to uh, families of UVM and uh, has been, been an exemplar uh, in the state and country. And we have visitors from, from around the world coming to the school. So I just want to stipulate that the, uh, the outstanding experience and the quality of this uh, school is, um, is there high and, and, and well recognized. So it doesn't surprise me that you will rightfully ask, how did we get here, if that's the case? Um, there were a number of factors that went into the decision. Um, for, for many years, for I, I've done a bit of a history on this uh, from, from the dean's office. I've been dean at the uh, College of Education and Social Services since uh, 2016. Um, my predecessor, Fannie Miller, uh, worked closely with the Campus Children's School as well, trying to find economies of scale, trying to figure out what a sustainable budget model looked like, um, and uh, struggled with that uh, for the better part of a decade of, of her tenure as dean. And I've spoken to previous deans that have uh, recounted similar challenges that, that they have faced um, as they have tried to uh, find a point of sustainability for the campus children's school. Nonetheless, we have kept it elevated as a priority uh, for funding um, in, in the college, through the college, with a subsidy from the, uh, from the university broadly. Now, um, it was uh, two weeks ago uh, as we were looking at the impacts of uh, the budgets uh, 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 from COVID, from uh, the enrollment impacts that we had in the spring and the uncertainty of enrollments that we're going to experience in the fall. I'm sure you're all aware of this through your connections to the colleges that it's uh, perhaps the most precarious time for, for institutions of higher education um, that we could face. Uh, as we reckoned with what the realities were, it became clear that the subsidy from 
the campus uh, was not going to be uh, coming this year. And that the cuts, the priorities that the campus had to make around the academic mission of the institution, academic programs, and our student success, as important as the campus children's school was, uh, President Garamella informed me that they would no longer be able to uh, provide the subsidy that uh, allowed us to make the proposition even viable from, from within the college. That and subsidy, to, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, am I right that that was about 550,000? Yes, that's what I was about to say. But the subsidy this year is about $550,000. That's pretty, been pretty stable over the last few years. Uh, and so we bring in uh, roughly between uh, 850 and $940,000 $940, a year in tuition. Uh, you can figure out what the expenses are by looking at that gap. Um, and uh, that has been an ongoing concern. The school is run uh, very well. Um, we have had a series of very capable directors. I don't think that there is waste in the school. Um, the realities of, of uh, our staffing arrangements within the university context, um, the location and facilities maintenance within the university context are different uh, than many uh, preschools, early childhood education providers or daycare uh, settings that, that you might compare us to. Uh, those things drive our cost structure considerably higher, hence the subsidy, and um, uh, we've gotten along. But when the subsidy was pulled, we had to uh, make a decision within the College of Education and Social Services of whether we could continue to sustain this. And uh, in a normal time, um, the answer would be, it would be extremely difficult at best because we run a very lean budget in the College of Education and Social Services. And um, again, the priorities are on our student programming and our student success. And as wonderful as the Campus Children's School is, it isn't a key part of our research uh, work in the college, as it has been in, peri in periods historically. Uh, it, it, it is not that today. So in some ways, this is a, a campus service as much as it is uh, an opportunity for our students to have uh, placements in a high quality uh, early childhood setting. Um, so before the pandemic, uh, the campus children's school operated uh, with about a $550,000 uh, deficit. Given the budget challenges that UVM is faced, combined with the small proportion of families that are served by the campus children's school, and there are about 65, I'm sorry, 55 families served by the campus children's school, and we have about 70 students uh, typically, the university determined on that basis that uh, the subsidy uh, couldn't be justified. And in the subsidy, it's important to, to recognize that any subsidy in the college, any subsidy at the university, is driven largely by student tuition dollars. So we need to ask ourselves, um, is a subsidy that we're providing for any activity on campus, since that's coming largely from student tuition dollars, is that subsidy speaking directly to the quality of the student experience, the strength of academic programming, and highlighting uh, the priority of student success? And uh, we weigh investments in programs uh, on that basis uh, as we uh, make decisions about how we're going to resource things. So um, we looked at just the normal ongoing operation, and then we considered uh, the guidance that we received from the governor's office and the guidance that we received from the CDC on reopening. And uh, that guidance uh, provided us with uh, a lot of concern about whether or not we could actually achieve a reopening in the physical space that, that we are in. Um, the physical spaces, the way that they're set up, uh, challenge our ability to comply the ratios in the ratios necessary of scaling back our students, while well, some instances we had to expand staff, made the economics almost impossible for us. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that uh, 900, you know, say $900,000 revenue stream that we were talking about, if we had to diminish that by a third or a half, in order to have the social distancing and meet the public health expectations and realities, our costs weren't going down, but our revenues were, were going to be cut pretty dramatically. And, and so the economies of scale began uh, working against us pretty powerfully. Another issue that challenged us in this process was the location of the campus children's school itself. And the campus children's school is located in our living learning uh, residence hall. 
and it's on the bottom floor of a student residence complex. And that presents uh, a lot of risks in the best of cases, uh, and it presents um, an untenable risk in, in a pandemic, frankly, to be mixing college students coming from different places in different areas with preschoolers and parents picking up preschoolers. They just look to us to be um, uh, a, a very problematic risk proposition and, and, and discouraged us from, uh, from really uh, getting excited about uh, how that was going to work there. Um, now, the, the location for the Campus Children's School has long been an issue at UVM, and there has been a, a bit of a perpetual hunt for a, a more appropriate space. Uh, the Campus Children's School not only sits at the bottom of the dormitory, it sits at what is arguably Burlington's uh, most treacherous uh, crossing on Main Street. And uh, so there are a number of concerns that, that spoke to us about facilities beyond just the, uh, the, our constraints on <coughs> configuration. And then um, the Campus Children's School, unlike early learning facilities found on some campuses, doesn't really serve as a laboratory school in the way that it does in some places. Uh, it does provide very uh, rich placement opportunities for our students in our early childhood education programs, early childhood and early childhood special education programs, but it's really only one site and a much larger constellation of sites that provide a diversity of settings throughout uh, the Burlington and, and Chittenden County area by and large. We're, we also have placements uh, in, in other parts of the state, but um, it, we, we, have, we have options in terms of where we're going to be um, placing our students across Vermont. The priority at the end of this was to protect the educational experiences of our students as we faced this significant budget challenge. And as important as the Campus Children's School is to our history and the impact that we've had and the support for our families, it was that on that basis that we concluded that um, the subsidy was no longer going to be uh, provided from the university and therefore within the college, this is something we were gonna have to shift our resources away to preserve jobs and programs that were gonna protect the student experience. So I'll stop right there. I know that was uh, perhaps more of a whirlwind tour through the logic of the decision-making, but uh, happy to. That was, that was great. I, just for clarification, um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, the pandemic created an emergency situation. Yeah. There were a couple of programs put into place to prevent this sort of closure, hopefully. Right. Um, did the university participate in those? Um, no, no, we did not. Um, okay. We made a commitment to all of our employees to fund them through uh, May 31st. Yeah. And that, that was coincident with the terminus of the stabilization programs. And uh, that worked quite well. We, we also had some challenges and Barbara, maybe you'd like to just speak to some of the uh, challenges that we saw in terms of our values in, in the environment that we work in related to that stabilization. Sure, when the, the stabilization first came out, the, the, the period that would run from, I think, April 6th through the, the end of May, um, it came with the caveat that if parents uh, chose not to or could not pay uh, half, then they would be disenrolled. And we did consider how that would disproportionately affect staff who had children at the center um, mm -hmm. if we had to disenroll them. And so obviously um, wealthier families, not, you know, from different colleges or different areas of campus um, would not have to unenroll their children. And we did not think that that was a good, good policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just wondering because in addition to those two programs, there's now a restart program that's offering currently a one-time payment to help with restarting, depending on how many students you have in the program. Um, and we're pushing for more. This may be moot at this point, but those were attempts by the state to put resources in the hands of centers. Um, but it sounds as though the scale of the shortfall with the subsidy no longer being provided would dwarf this money anyway. That's, that, that's correct, Senator Bruce. And I, I would just add that uh, this isn't as simple as saying, can you afford the campus children's school? Mm -hmm. The budget's facing a crisis, unlike it's faced in uh, decades, perhaps maybe uh, ever. I can't quite go that far, but let's just say this is uh, an existential threat to the university. Within my own college, 
uh, of education and social services, uh, we're facing an $885,000 deficit this year. Um, and uh, the prospect of putting three, $400,000 into any unit that's not core to our student programming um, is uh, it's just not viable for us. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, it's not a matter of just saving one thing. It's a matter of uh, limiting the amount of damage to our core mission and obligations uh, as we go forward right now. Yep, understood. Um, Barbara Burrington, uh, are there things you'd like to add? You know, I could, I could, I've been the interim uh, director for three years and, but previously, like when your daughter was there a long time ago, um, I was the head teacher there for 14 years. So I have a historical perspective and, and all I can say is that um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have that, that these three years as interim, we have um, starting in 2017, we worked with an external reviewer from the University of Illinois to really look at the model because the, the, the handwriting was on the wall that this is not fiscally sustainable. So we've been over the course of three years implementing some of those, most of those efficiencies that we could. We've actually, that 550 is less than it was three years ago by, by a few hundred thousand. Um, but we do suffer from all of the um, uh, issues that childcare in Vermont and across the country, you know, face with turnover and staff and things like that. And we seized those things, the process of attrition, for example, to implement a, um, a more hierarchical structure of lead teachers and assistant teachers. Um, but, but really, we couldn't keep pace with the fact that the cost kept rising. We have been raising tuition um, annually, five and a quarter percent. That next year's budget was looking at an eight and a quarter percent increase for families. Um, you know, I, I think we had some, we had some very creative thoughts about ways to not only um, make the campus school more sustainable, uh, but also more integrated into the community to perhaps do things to say, work with community partners, um, look at um, get, uh, getting a more diverse child population. So it would be um, even a better uh, experience for undergraduate students. So when uh, Dean Thomas refers to 70 students, he means 70 children. Um, we, we don't have that many students. Uh, in in like an infant toddler course, vis, you know, using the school as a practicum site or or pre K site, um, for that matter. So uh, we had looked at a number of things. Um, those hadn't happened. That doesn't mean that they won't now that uh, the president and the provost have established um, the concept of uh, an advisory board moving forward to look at childcare as as an issue on campus and as a um, as, a, as a, the right thing to do for children and families uh, mm -hmm. as employees. So I'm hopeful that some of those ideas will get back on the table and maybe um, gain some traction. Mm -hmm. Great questions, Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, a few questions. Um, so um, this has been always only for um, UVM employees is is that is that right? Or did you did you ever accept uh, families from outside the uh, Senator Ingram? It, it in the last thirty years has it's only been a um, year round childcare center for thirty years, and yes, it's been employee based. If a family left UVM while their children were enrolled, we the policy has always been that they they can stay. Um, but it's definitely for UVM families. And uh, if, if, for example, in our handbook, we say straight, straight up, we make it very clear that your, tui that your tuition dollars cover about half and the rest is um, a, a subsidy from the college. Yes. Um, historically, before that, Scott alluded to, we'd had that, and, and Senator Bruth, that we'd had that um, celebration. It was a, a part-time pre-K program and it was 50-50 children from the community in the morning and um, half the children stayed 
the rest of the day and those were university children. There's had some iterations of that over the years, uh, but for 30 years, it's been an employee-based childcare center. Okay, and I'm sorry, how many families did you say um, it was serving like through the last year? Uh, fit, right when we closed on March 17th, we were at 55 UVM families and 53 non-UVM families. Other now I'm confused. I'm sorry. You <laughs> so there were non. There were not. Right. I just said there weren't. That it was for. It was designed for. Right. We had. Uh, we had three families who had been employed at UVM who had um, oh, who left, left for other employment opportunities, but their children stayed. I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and, I, I heard. I heard her say 106 when I added that up too. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the the uh, the help. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, yes, my last question I think is um, uh, so um, President um, Garamella's um, memo that we have uh, does also allude to trying to help find uh, placements for um, for for these children. Is that is that sort of happening now? And um, who, who's doing that at the university? Do you want me to? Address uh, Barbara, if you would go ahead, if you spoke with uh, our director for external relations today <laughs> or communicated with I him. did. Um, uh, Dr. Tiffany Sten Spencer is, as Scott said, external relations. I think of her as a community liaison. Um, she's going to be uh, consulting with um, the, the child care resource in Williston. Um, at this point, you know, we have a list of questions for them, of course, because there's so much that's unknown in the childcare community right now. We don't know how many spaces are actually going to be available, how many places that reopen um, will have families returning, how many will be holding their spaces. So we want to make sure that their data is um, good before we actually suggest to families that we use them as a resource. I've had personal correspondence with colleagues. Um, there's a um, group in the Chittenden County area of directors, there are 65 of us. We communicate through a listserv. Um, most are facing enrollment issues right now. Um, and not to be crass, but to, when I have heard that there is a place that's facing an enrollment issue, I am noting that for our families that they may, if if they want to put their child in group care at this time, they may want to contact those specific centers. Oh yeah, I mean, it might be a boon for other other child care facilities in some, I'm, in some ways. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, other, other questions? Senator Hardy, then Senator Perchley. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so I, I just want to clarify, did you take advantage of the stabilization payments or not? I wasn't clear. No, we did not. not. We did not. You did not. And it was partly in part because you felt uncomfortable with the unenrolling family situation. And that was part of it. And we as, we as a university made a commitment to our employees to fund everyone through May 31st, which covered that period as well. Okay. Because you could have received funding, stabilization funding yeah. from the state in order to help you pay for the salaries of those uh, employees rather than charging it to your own budget. Have, that, had that's correct. Advantage of that program. So it, it seems kind of strange that you wouldn't have at least taken advantage of the assistance that the state did offer for child care centers during this mm -hmm. uh, uh time. Um, and I, do any of you, the families, do you participate in the pre-K program? Are you a certified pre-K program? So you get the... the yes, yes. We, are, we, we are compliant with Act 166. We're a five-star program. We have contracts with 11 school districts. We have um, about 31 children headed to kindergarten. Okay. And do you, do you have any students who are on subsidies, the CCFAP uh, payments from the states, from the state? Three. You have three, okay. Out of the 55 families? Out of that? the 70 children, 55 yeah. families, 70 children. Oh, children. 70 families. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you have received some state funding for the program, but not a significant amount, it sounds like, at least not from the subsidy payments. We, we have continued to operate remotely 
and continue to take, um, you know, the, the kind of attendance that's required um, by the public school districts. If, um, if that's what you're asking, I'm not quite sure, but we, we have done that and we are continuing to do that. We are still licensed and operating through the month of June. So um, our, cl our classroom teachers are still having Zoom meetings with their families. We're still posting activities um, to do at home. We're still engaging with individual families for conferences and, and things like that. Okay, for the pre-K students, I was more asking well, about actually. in general whether you got even during sort of quote unquote normal times, whether you got state assistance for some children in your program. And it sounds like you did did get pre-K dollars and some subsidies for a few students. Well, I would I would argue that that, that getting those pre-K dollars does nothing to help facilitate our budget issues. We have to give every one of those dollars to the families. Those that they receive, it, we re, it comes right off their bill. It actually costs us money to participate because you have to have licensed teachers, which we do anyway because of our context. But it, it's a lot of overhead, 11 school districts, 11 contracts. One of the things that we did actually to streamline our participation in Act 166 was centralize our billing uh, over to you know, whoever the finance people are in Waterman that could um, do that more efficiently than we could as a child care center with a part-time administrative assistant. So I, I don't know, um, you know, full-time child care centers that are making um, money, generating revenue off participating in Act 166. No, that wasn't my, but it makes it more accessible to the families in your, in your care because it reduces the tuition that they pay by a, a, a small amount, at least, given that your tuition rate is fairly high, it sounds like. Our tuition rate is l lower than some and higher than others. It's around $300 a week. Flat rate, infant, toddler, or preschooler. So for an infant toddler, it's, it's quite a good deal. And uh -huh. for preschoolers, it's quite a good deal because, um, you know, it's, uh, they get that, that $3,500 credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just trying to get a sense of what state funding you had taken advantage of in the past. And I'm just wondering, Dean Thomas, um, the, this, it sounds like the program, the $550,000 was part of the College of Education budget. Um, and I'm curious why that wasn't a budget just you know, not attributed to the College of Education because it's more, you say that the program is less of an educational service to your students, to UVM students, and more of a service to UVM families, the families of people who are employed at UVM. Um, and I'm wondering if the university, maybe this is a question for Wendy more, but the university looked at just shifting the budget to a different part of the university ever, uh, I mean, maybe not now, but in the past, so that it wasn't being charged to an academic program, but was more being charged as, as uh, sort of part of human uh, resources or uh, benefits for employees, because it seems to me that that's what it ended up, it's been more right, than. Well, certainly in the four years that I've been there, it has been directly located in an academic unit as most of these services are. Uh, we are the College of Education and Social Services. We do use it as a placement site for our students. Um, so I think that logic is that we're, we're the people who know most about that. And um, the, the College of Education and Social Services is a logical home uh, for, the, for this unit, uh, and it would provide a subsidy for it, its operation. So I, that, that is the logic that I walked into. Wendy, you were here long before I, Barbara, you were here as well. So, um, you know, if there were times in the past where uh, it was centralized differently or there's talk about it, maybe that's relevant. I, I don't know the answer to that, Ruth. I would have to research that for you. As long as I've been at UVM, it's been housed within the college. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I would, could speculate that it started, as I had said, as that morning preschool program, and that was situated within um, the Department of uh, Integrated Professional Studies. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, that that's all that I would know about that. But yeah. in president and provost's um, communication today, um, to your point, it does say that this would be, I think, an initiative um, uh, situated in human resources. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is that effort to centralize it so there, there can be more equitable participation in these programs at the campus level. That, that would be one of the ideals in this. 
But the continuing pandemic and related financial and regulatory impacts brought us to a final recognition that continuing operations is unsustainable. I just want to make sure it sounds as though he's referencing regulatory guidelines around restarting post-pandemic. Uh, is, is that, to your knowledge, what he means by regulatory impacts, or are there other state regulations that he's referencing? My conversations with the president and the provost have been around uh, the healthcare guidance around reopening. So it's not necessarily, these aren't legislative regulations, these are uh, health regulations and gubernatorial guidance that are uh, making the reopening, um, just putting us on very different terms than we would normally operate. Okay, well that's, um, it's reassuring to know that we're not um, doing something on the regulatory side that contributed to this. I, I think it's fair to say our, our whole discussion keep referencing the fact that all of these programs, you know, large centers, home-based centers, everybody's gonna be facing reduced bottom lines as they allow fewer students. We're trying desperately to figure out how to get more money into the hands of these sorts of programs. I'm, in this situation, I'm only sorry that we weren't alerted at, at, a, at a previous point where we might have um, work to see if there was something else the state could do for UVM and mm -hmm. St. Mike's to keep the programs up and running. Right. Um, committee members, any, uh, Senator Perchlick? Yeah, um, I guess it's as, as these different child care centers close, I'm hoping that we capture their kind of intelligence on, on what made it different, and especially when they're closed, they're a little more free to maybe point out some of the regulations that maybe didn't cause them to close, but definitely made it more difficult. I hear from the child care providers in my district about some of those difficulties. So it'd be great if the campus center did talk, you know, kind of an, not an after action review, but just like, here are the things that made it more difficult. You know, there was other budget issues clearly, but it would be good as we look to strengthen our child care providers that we hear from those that closed what were the things that made it difficult to stay open and what what kind of advice they would give to try to prevent future centers from closing i i think that thank you for that i um serve on the um policy committee for let's grow kids i have for the past couple of years and that is something that they we are thinking about and i'm sure that let's grow kids would be a great ally in and something like that. I can tell you from um, the people that are, are speaking together on the list serve different directors that staffing is certainly a challenge on uh, reopening. If people had let staff go, um, perhaps they're doing fine on unemployment or not. That is a, that is a reality. Um, but the other is that some providers and teachers just um, listen to the science of uh, d infectious disease and they weigh that against the science of child development and they just don't feel comfortable going back into a setting during a pandemic and having to alter their pedagogy in such a way as masks, physically separating children, changing clothes constantly, putting chicken wire or barricades on their playground. Um, in our, in our physical layout, um, we'd be greatly reduced because we have two classrooms that share a bathroom. We have a classroom that doesn't have, that even though it has outdoor egress, it's not a way that parents could enter. Um, so it's more, you know, it's more of an emergency escape. So we, we, were, we were trying to figure and reconcile some of those things. Uh, and, and I know other centers have very similar issues. Uh, Dean Thomas. Uh, Senator Booth and, and committee, um, I just want to be clear that the University of Vermont and the College of Education and Social Services is not out of the business of early childhood education. In fact, we're squarely in it. We're very interested in finding solutions to the bigger problem. The loss of the campus children's school is, is just crushing to us locally. Um, but the campus children's school didn't contribute a great deal to the bigger issues of inclusive, affordable, high quality early learning experiences for students across Vermont. 
And that's something that we are committed to working on and, and addressing. Um, over the last year, year and a half, uh, I have been involved with uh, Kyle Dodson at the y Burlington YMCA and Sean McBannon at the Winooski Unified School District. And we have partnered to identify how we could uh, establish prototypes of models to bring the strengths of these three partners as one example, uh, together to come up with a model that might defy some of the issues that we're talking about today. And uh, so we're working on what these little, we're calling them pop-ups because they would be pilots. And to see if we can identify pilots that uh, have promise to sustainability and quality and uh, then see what we might do to be able to scale those, uh, not just in Chittenden County, our eyes across Vermont. And we're deeply committed to, to, to that work and to pursuing this. We've been set back right now, obviously, because of the pandemic. Uh, but this is a durable commitment from, from our college. And uh, I know that we would uh, welcome the opportunity to work with members of your committee and, and the state to, uh, to pursue that at our fullest. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Philip, I was going to say, I don't know if this is of interest to you or not. However, there's um, the Yale Child Development Center has a uh, researcher, um, Elliot Haspel, and he has a new book out called Crawling Behind. It's about the child care crisis, and it has some fundamental policy advice in there. I just started it. Uh, it's fascinating in terms of um, how to address and how to possibly fix the child care crisis. I, I mean, I, I don't subscribe to the the term crisis, let's say this opportunity to, to reform and think about how we care for our nation's children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and thank you both and Wendy um, for taking time today. I know that you're busy. Um, just wanna say again, nobody appreciates everything you've done over the years more than me. Um, so we're, we are uh, saddened to see you go but I understand that the college has a commitment. UVM has always been a fantastic community partner in terms of um, drawing in uh, children of people with uh, financial needs. Um, so I look forward to seeing some future iteration that will, that will hopefully get us back in a, a place similar to where we once were. But, uh, I understand the realities of the finances at this point. Um, thanks very much. We're gonna turn to boring legislation at this point. You're, you're free to stay on, but we will not be offended if you immediately leave, I would. Um, but thanks very much again. Thank you all. Thank you, Daddy. Okay, um, committee members, uh, Jim, are you still with us? Are you one of the non-video participants? I now? am, and my video is going on right now. There I am. So Jim, looking at you now, it's, I feel like I'm cast back into the, the 1850s or something. You, between what's behind you and your hair, it's like looking at Ethan Allen or a uh, well, <laughs> somebody. Yeah, I already know. I have my hair cut today, so this is a cut version. <laughs> but but you know the antiques behind you just give it all this unified look. So it's great. I guess so. <laughs> okay, so committee. I spoke with um, Senator Kitchell, and then I was in appropriations to talk about a different bill, and we discussed um, 224, which is our miscellaneous bill. And she was very amenable to what we were talking about. So Jim, she's asked if you can draft an amendment for appropriations. Um, so it would be drafted in such a way that appropriations could present it and it would strip out the sections we talked about stripping out. Yeah, I've done that already. Actually, it's, it's on your... Okay. Uh, we can go through it. Jeannie has it. Um, let's, let's do that. Okay, and, and it's drafted coming from appropriations? It is, yep. Great. Is okay. it the one that's on our website, Jim? It should be. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. I point one. From one appropriations. One. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, draft 1.1. 1. 1. Okay. And don't we walk through it? I mean. Yeah, just quickly. Okay, all right. So basically, um, 
Section one and two is on the AVIC language uh, in terms of school records for uh, colleges that close. Um, section three is the repeal of the oath requirement. Yep. Section four is the small school support section, the Bobby Starr language that prevents the pre-K program from knocking out a school from small school support. Uh, section five deals with elections of uh, union school districts, the very specific issue that um, AOE had, um, deal with the mechanical issue about how elections are held. Um, six is the gender balance on UVM and BSC boards. And that is it. And then the seven is the effective date on passage. Okay. Any uh, questions for Jim? Um, I would just so uh, this leaves out the two sections on school wellness and the uh, menstrual hygiene, which got moved over to H six hundred and sixty. Yeah, correct. Yep. Nice. Okay, so um, I don't doesn't look like anybody has any issues with this drafting. So, Jim, can you pass that on to approach or did you? Oh, Ruth. I just wanted to ask a question because. Maybe Andy was just going to ask this. There was we we were looking for clarification on the election section and oh, right. Right. Jim's explanation because we couldn't quite remember the genesis. Yeah. Of yeah. It. So the issue here is um, the, the problem is what happens when you have a union school district um, and one of the members of that union school district is another union school district. And, because usually what happens um, for a union school district is the members are um, towns um, and they have all the machinery to hold the election on the mechanics. But if the member is another union school district doesn't have that stuff, uh, this mechanics. So what this does is it passes, it looks through the member union school district and the underlying towns of that district to do the mechanics. Okay. And this came from AOE, if I remember. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Andy? My question is, why is it not just fixing that issue? If that's an underlying problem, this doesn't fix that underlying problem. It just kicks it to 2021. Yeah, it's the same reason um, we've been doing this for a couple of, couple of years in other areas as well. It's because AOE is working on that whole rewrite of chapter 11. Uh, which is a chapter that is used to form union school districts. And that chapter was borrowed uh, to form unified school districts, but it didn't work very well because it's not designed for that purpose. So AOE has a whole rewrite of this chapter. And so we're just doing small things for a couple of years until we, we get that chapter rewritten. And they were gonna do it this year, but um, there's a desire at least by Chair Webb not to do anything that had any, any um, implications of F46 uh, this, this session. <laughs> so. Fair enough. Okay, and so just to clarify again, so if there is a member that's on the unified board, but isn't from a unified district, but it's just like representing a town, you know, then, then uh, they're not all board members that become a vacant position on the unified board would be appointed this way. It's only in certain circumstances. That's not this language, though. That that language was taken taken out of this bill. Oh, okay. That's the more yeah. the language you're thinking about, which is a different point. Okay. Yeah, we got rid of that because they're going to stick it in something elsewhere in the house. Okay. Yeah. And okay. then we can we can decide what we think when it gets over to us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, Jim. Uh, I forget now, it was only a minute ago that I asked you, but did this already go to either Stephanie or Chrissy at Approps? Nope. Okay, if you could send it um, maybe to Stephanie, nope. and then I think I'm gonna be in Approps tomorrow to talk about the other bill. I think it's um, Senator Kitchell's intention to vote it out, this out tomorrow. So if you can send that to them, Yep. They'll be all ready to do that vote. Yep. Um, just 
just one other thing. We did a sign long ago in a, in a land far away. We did assign <laughs> presenters, but now we've pulled out certain sections. Um, do the people remember who were presenting which of these sections? Okay, all right. I think I was presenting the stuff that we pulled out and taken over to healthcare. Okay, well, <laughs> let's, let's go up to, um, since it's now seven sections or so, I think it would be silly to have more than two people. Um, but Jim McNeil has yet to report a bill. So I, I think Jim McNeil should maybe report the first half. Uh, Jim McNeil might not be present for this. Oh, okay. How come? What, what does Jim McNeil have to do? Um, a rendezvous with my <laughs> grandson on the way to North Carolina. So does that mean you're, so, you're not going to be with us for the rest of the session? No, that means I'm going to be missing for about maybe three days or so. That's all right. This Because I'm hoping to get the call sooner than later to head out of town to pick him up. So okay. that's why well, I don't want to obligate myself to. Okay, to be, to be safe then. Um, yeah, because if I get the call and things are good with my daughter, I head out. So I'm, I left it with that with my chair and transportation also. Okay, he's, so he's aware of both. Corey, you want to pick up the first half of this? Sure. Let's what say, do you mean by first half? So that would be sections one, uh, repeal of the oath. Oops. One, two, two is the transition. Three. So one and two go together, three, and then small school support. Sure. And, and then um, I don't know, there's a, there's a, we have two people on the committee who have made gender equity a signature issue, um, Debbie and Ruth. I don't know, would one of you like to do the second half? Debbie, you can do it because it doesn't have any Latin in it. So I only do bills. <laughs> <laughs> so I mess them up. I like that. I can, okay. I can first of all, you handled it fine. Well, I, li I really like no, Senator I'm, Starr's I'm response, I'm though. That he was You're sure that we had some of those critters in Vermont somewhere. <laughs> I, I loved it, Ruth, when you <laughs> threw it to Bobby because Bobby got this <laughs> totally hunted look on his face. <laughs> no, I knew he was not going to know, but I was like, I didn't want to. He's the chair, so I almost actually was like, I bet this chair of education, I almost threw it to you, Phil, because I thought you would know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you didn't because rat, what was it, ratites? Ratites. Right, yeah. I would have said rats. Um, it's funny, Debbie trusted me, but I didn't. I know, I was, look, I was looking them up, I was Googling them <laughs> and trying to text you frantically. <laughs> and I knew that Pearson was looking it up too, but I thought it would be an insult to throw it to him and not the chair. So anyway, but no, had, you can do this if you want, Debbie, I don't care. <laughs> I had great respect for the fact that Chris um, copped to Googling it, because the temptation must have been to just rattle it off, you know? <laughs> Oh. Yeah, because I think that Lieutenant Governor actually knew that a rantite was a was a too late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so Corey and, and Debbie will report it, assuming it gets voted out tomorrow. It would show up. Uh, we'd probably do it Wednesday, maybe. Um, so just okay. for timing's sake, Jim, did you have a was Could oh, I no, still Debbie? Ask, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question though about maybe Jim? Because maybe Jim remembers this. So the the sections that we sent over to health and welfare um, the, about the wellness um, council, um, Senator Lyons was asking whether we had talked about um, connecting the, with like the prevention, the drug prevention council or um, behavioral prevention stuff or ACEs or, you know, there are, there are these other councils around. Does anybody remember whether we talked about? No. That stuff? No, that's health and welfare um, territory. See? Yeah. So they, so we can, now that's with health and welfare, we can just do anything we want, right? Absolutely. You don't care. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I trust you. Okay. Let's, let's go to our last item, which is, um, Andy has a, a, a draft. Is that up on our website, Andy? Yes. Yes, it is. 
Okay, so let's let's take a look at that. And Andy, if you can just walk us through what you've been doing and um, what you've come up with so far. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to you for getting that up on the site quickly. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, we heard from Norm that, hey, you know, I've been in all the schools and, and I've worked with him in the past on energy issues. And then I reached out to others. I've sent this to what we might call the regular cast of characters, mainly. I mainly might have been in communication with Jeff Francis of the Superintendent's Association. He sent out an earlier version and gave me comments. Uh, also, Efficiency Vermont uh, took an earlier version and put it into kind of a more present. I did like an outline and the, one of the early issues was who would administer this program and who could administer it quickly and could AOE, you know, when they came in, they talked about needing staff and I was trying to get BGS to do it, but they were like, you know, pleading with me not to make them do it. So it came up as a suggestion that efficiency Ron was already working in schools. This was from Norm. And so I reached out to them and they were uh, great sports about saying, yeah, we could, we're happy to look at this and, and talk about it. So I gave them an earlier draft the last few days. They've been talking, they have relationships with all the contractors that do this kind of work throughout the state because HVAC systems are often uh, good places for energy saving. So, you know, Efficiency Vermont's focus in the past has been on energy savings, but they work in this space a lot and know all the contractors and the, and the, and the folks that are, that are doing this kind of work. So they've been a great help on trying to figure out what the details of the program would be and if they could administer it and they, they said they could. So these, these few pages here just kind of lay out what it would be and what we're trying to do is something that could happen very quickly because it would ideally this work would happen before the kids get back in school, even though we're, we put December as the deadline because we're hoping to use the CARES Act money. Uh, really, it would be good if it could happen soon. And there was some concern about whether there was enough contractors available, um, but the reports back have said that there is enough kind of capacity of the workforce to get a decent amount of work done. And one of the things if you kind of look at the footnote, there's no dollar numbers really in here, except there's a footnote there about a $5 million program. And one of the earlier earlier drafts was less than that, mainly because we just didn't think we could get that much work done by December, but it kind of got up to a larger number partially to get attention to folks that it's a serious program. If it's everybody that works in the space knows that the need is like 900 million. So if we issue a program that's, you know, 2 million, it's kind of like nobody takes it seriously and they'll pursue other work, but a, a $5 million program kind of gets noticed and people think, okay, there's some real money here. We can, we can get the things done that we, the need to get done, but we can also get it. It's not too much that it can't get done in the, in the time frame. Um, there's one of the things that Jeff Francis and superintendent was concerned about is equity and how we kind of make sure the small schools or those schools that don't have experience getting grants or working with the state. So we're trying to run it as a program where they could basically do the work. They don't have to like file an application, wait to see if they score well and return back. But really the, the administrators of the program would reach out to those schools and then the other schools would just like, There'd be a list of things that they could do. They kind of get a pre-approval of, of these projects, maybe even also of contractors, and then they just get the work done. And then we reimburse them as long as the work that they did was within the dollar, dollar range that we have set in the list of measures. And the only other thing that I'll kind of highlight, assuming you don't want me to go through every paragraph here, is there's some statutory requirements on bidding for projects that kind of slow projects down. And so there was an interest of maybe if, if we have a pre-approved list of contractors, you don't need to follow the bidding requirements. So you can just get the work done with a bidder that you could find. If you find somebody that's qualified and they can do the work, you just get the work done and then mm -hmm. uh, get reimbursed. So that's on the, on the page three under statutory changes. 
So I don't know if that is a good I, I like that very much because, you know, we should be lined up against the wall and shot if we don't take advantage of this opportunity from the federal government. You know, when we're constantly talking about all the deferred maintenance we have and how we don't, don't want to put it on the property tax and the education fund. So if we have to suspend some contracting rules to make sure that we can get this work done, um, you know, I, I think on balance, that makes sense to me. Although ideally, you, you'd want a, a bidding process for every job. Um, Jim, my, my biggest question about this is, what's the most efficient way? Um, I look at this, and it seems like a grant program that appropriations would develop. And, you know, like they did with the, uh, with the frontline worker um, pay, what, what did we call it, essential worker um, grants. Um, and so our committee could pass it out, uh, but then it would, it would take its various stops and then its various stops in the house. And that would consume, you know, a month. Uh, we'd be, we'd be lucky to get it over to the house by the time we adjourn. Um, so I'm just wondering about ideas to streamline. I could, uh, Andy did, um, you you attach this to your email, right, Andy? Uh, to you, okay. yeah. I sent it to you and the committee members. And I, well, I was thinking of uh, Senator Ash and Senator Kitchell. No, that I did send them an email, but that was just because I knew they probably get too many emails and wouldn't read a long thing. So that was just a couple of paragraphs. I didn't attach this to them yet. So um, why don't we do this as just a starter? Because I'm I'm. I'm just going to explore before we do anything formal, if there isn't a way to advance it out of our committee into the hands of appropriations. So if you could send it to um, Senator Ash and Peter Sterling and say it comes from the Ed Committee and, and maybe that I'll be in touch uh, with Tim about, about it, because I know he liked the idea um, Senator Kitchell liked the idea. She was just worried about more than one conversation going on at once. So I, I do think it would be better if something this specific related to the, to the grant funding was just picked up and worked on in appropriations. So if you can do that, I'll, I'll have a conversation with Tim today or tomorrow. Uh, by the time we come back on Tuesday, I'll try to report on that. Does anybody see anything in here that might need revision or that doesn't look like it's it's uh, at a stage to be passed on? Ruth. I just had a question. I, I'm, you know, Andy, you and I had talked about this a little bit when you started working on this. And some of the concerns I'd heard or thought of were one, you know, there is there aren't standards in here for what kind of system the state would be paying for, or at least I didn't see them. Um, so, you know, would the state just pay for any kind of ventilation system, wh however it's installed, you know, or th is there some kind of requirement for it? it has to be to these standards? So that's one question. And then the second question is to this issue of, you know, uh, the condition, the overall condition of school buildings, um, whether or not we want to be investing in some school buildings that maybe shouldn't should no longer be school buildings or uh, only have are you know at 20 percent capacity or whatever and you know there's sort of no standards for this is a worthwhile project because this building is is worth saving and there are enough kids you, you know what I mean so I, I guess those issues about whether or not this even though it is federal money and we should be using it and everything we you know whether or not we it's it's becoming tighter and tighter so those kinds of questions so, well your first question if you look at the very first paragraph number one under scope the last 
part of it. I don't know if it's all one run on sentence. The second sentence, it talks about uh, COVID-19 specific guidance for schools put out by the CDC and ASHRAE. They, both of those entities have put out guidance about what air handling systems. And, you know, so as far as COVID, that's the guidance that would be. And then Efficiency Vermont would definitely have guidance and ASHRAE has this too about, you know, how to do it the most energy efficient and cost-effective ways. What is ASHRAE? ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioner Engineers. Oh, I, I should have You can join. <laughs> it's, it's popular. You have, it's right there, the first paragraph. <laughs> oh, it is? Yeah. <laughs> There oh, it's up there. I didn't scroll up far enough. It sounds <laughs> bad. Yeah. The, the ratites are in charge. The ratites are in there. <laughs> um, to, to Ruth's other point, I, I guess my own feeling is if we're going to put kids in the school starting in the fall and this will make it a healthier environment and the federal government's going to pay, even if we were going to tear mm -hmm. the school down in February, I would still say do it because, you know, Otherwise, we're deliberately not improving up to CDC guidelines, a school where children are going to be educated even for a year, two years. Um, and again, if the state paying for it, it would be one thing, but the money's there to improve the, the health experience for kids going back to school. So, um, okay, so uh, then Andy, if you can mail that to Senator Ash and, and say, I'll be following up with a discussion uh, yeah, about we'll it. Yeah, so, I'll CC you on that email. Okay, great. Um, so that's what we had on the agenda for today.